How's it going? Hey, I'm, uh, I have been tasked with doing announcements today, so if you, uh, they're in your bulletin, but I'm just going to highlight a few, so if you want to look at it with me, you can. Uh, WMU July Mission Project Buddy Backpack Program is uh, on again for this year. Uh, items for low-income children need to be brought to the church office by July 28th, July 28th, and that's an easy date for me. That's my wedding anniversary. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I can't forget that one, right? Um, Operation Christmas Child, uh, just to highlight that, continue to think about that and continue to purchase. Uh, now is a good time to buy things because school supplies are arriving. So if you're out and about and see stuff, uh, grab it. Uh, July, of course, is composition books for older children and coloring books and drawing pa paper for the younger ones. And start planning ahead because August is the 24 count crayon boxes, boxes of crayons, okay? 24 count, all right? Uh, there's uh, a lots of more information there uh, in that announcement, which I encourage you to read through. Uh, vacation Bible School, we've been pushing that to you. Uh, please consider helping in any way you can. Volunteers are needed, obviously. Uh, please see Miss Amanda Salman, her phone number's in the bulletin there. Um, uh, the dates are August 1 through 5, August 1 through 5. So uh, be, be in prayer for that now, okay? Start now because we just we want the Holy Spirit to soften hearts for that week, okay? Um, a youth activity that, that I want to highlight, there's actually three of them in here, but the one I want to bring up today is the Sundays on Sunday. Youth, uh, that's for you guys. Uh, meet at Tracy's house uh, for uh, goodies, okay? Uh, the one thing we wanted to point out is that there's no van transportation for that event. You need to make your way there on your own. There's a phone number if you need to contact her. And bring a friend, okay? All right, that's for the youth. Am I right, Tracy? Youth? Darn, I was going to go. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's begin our worship together. It's good to see all you folks. Oh, good and gracious Heavenly Father, we bring all that we are to praise you and give glory to your name. You are worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your perfect sinless blood to apply it to our hearts so that we can come before the Father's holy presence. Oh, Lord, we don't ever want to take all that you have done for us for granted. We want to let the truth of who you are and all that you have done sit fresh upon our hearts today. Lord, may it soak into the deepest, most sacred parts of our hearts. You are our shepherd and savior, our rescuer and restorer of our souls. You have proven yourself worthy of our trust and all our praise, and we want to follow you with our whole heart. Lord, give us opportunities to share your love with other people and give us the courage to obey when the Holy Spirit nudges us. May our actions and words, Lord, bring life and grace to others and glory and honor to you. May our lives be a fragrant offering, fully surrendered to you today, a living sacrifice of our spiritual worship. God, you are so good. And we praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Good morning, I'm Kathy. I forgot to say that earlier. Uh, and Daniel and his family uh, are on vacation. And so we want to remember them, that they have a safe and blessed time together. Um, we have this morning with us uh, Reverend Paul Fowler, who will be bringing our message. And um, we are so glad to have you to come and do that this morning. So we welcome you now, Brother Paul. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. It's certainly good to be in the Lord's house. And Kathy and Bill and our musician and choir, thank you for the wonderful music this morning. And especially that message that God is so 
good. Um, not too long ago, uh, Donna had handed me a, a mask. It was black, but it had a white uh, monogram on it. It said, God is good. And I went into a store and this lady said, God is good. And he's good all the time. So uh, we want to keep that in mind, that God is good and he's good all the time. Even if we don't understand what he's doing. I ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. And I want to read verses 1 through 12. Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Very familiar story to most of us this morning. This is the healing of the paralytic man. Again, Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days of absence. And it was reported that he was in the house. And immediately many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door and he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. And he was carried by four. And when they could not come near unto him for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed in which the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why reason ye these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up your bed, and go your way into your own house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful privilege to be able to be together here today in this sanctuary. Thank you for your presence in our midst. Now, we know, Lord, that for more than a year, uh, we have been involved in so many creative ways of worshiping you. Lord, we have missed being able to assemble in the sanctuary. But Lord, we're so thankful that we're here this morning and we're thankful, Lord God, for the amplification of your Holy Spirit as we are together in oneness of heart, one mind, and in one spirit. Father, thank you for this story of Jesus and the way that he healed this man who was paralyzed. We pray, O Lord God, that you would help all of us to be mindful of the fact that Jesus was, is, and forever shall be the great physician, as the psalmist says to us, that he heals all of our diseases. He mends our broken hearts, and he helps us, Lord God, day by day with all of the troubles and the trials and the tribulations that life brings to us. But we thank you, Lord God, that there's a wonderful note of joy in the presence of your Holy Spirit. And in spite of all of the things that might drag us down, 
you are always building us up and you are always filling, filling us with that wonderful spirit of joy. And so, Lord, help us today to feel the joy of being healed in body, mind, soul, and spirit. And help us, Lord, as we share together cooperatively in the ministry that you have called your blessed church to. Now, Father, we thank you and we bless you and we praise you and we do so in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Jesus had been absent from this particular town, Capernaum. Uh, this is kind of like trying to pronounce the word Calibit Springs, isn't it? Did I say it correctly? Uh, I, I hope I did because for years I said it wrong. I really did. And finally, some folks that were from there, they told me, says, now, this is the way you say that word. So Capernaum, and then Jesus now had returned. He had come back to town, and news was out. Um, we Baptists know very well that if anything is going on in our fellowship, it doesn't take long for the word to get out. Brother Barry can break his toe, and I'll guarantee you all of us by dark, we'll know about it. Uh, it'll be by word of mouth, and nowadays that wonderful invention, the telephone. And all of you who are computer wizards, you can just tell the whole world, Barry broke his toe. How do you do that? Running from Donna. <laughs> So the news is out, Barry. You can't hide it anymore. Now, Jesus had returned to town, and the news was out, and he was in the house. Now, Mark, uh, as we studied, can you believe it, a year and a half ago, uh, was very economical with his words. He didn't tell us whose house it was. It just simply says that Jesus was in the house and everyone came to see him and to hear him. I dream of the day when people will think about the church and say on Sunday morning, I've got to go to church. Whether it's here at Lillington or any one of the thousand places that people could attend worship I just pray for the day when people will say, Jesus is there, and I want to go and share fellowship with him and with his people. And indeed, let's pray that Jesus will make that prayer come true. Now, as we think about Jesus here in this particular story, he is teaching and then Mark brings our attention to this man who was paralyzed. Now, uh, I have never been paralyzed for very long, but I remember some years ago, just before um, I was about to put uh, my preacher clothes on, I fell. I had just come out of the shower uh, and for whatever reason, I just collapsed. Hit my head on the door striker. It took, what, five or six stitches to get me sewn back together. Uh, but I was out for, I don't know how long I was out, uh, but it was dark in there, I can tell you that. Uh, and I couldn't move. And for some times, even after the EMTs arrived, Mr. Fowler, can you sit up for us? And I'd raise my head, and that was all I could do. These two big, hefty, burly guys just manhandled me and helped me get down the stairs. But for some time, 
I couldn't do anything. I couldn't lift my head up. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't do anything. And I thought, my goodness, I've had a stroke. But these guys, they were laughing and joking with me and said, now, you're going to have to stop malingering. Now, those of you who have never served in the military, that is a word that you want to learn. It means stop pretending that you're sick. And so they wanted me to stop pretending. Well, we, we laughed and uh, cut up all the way to the hospital. But anyway, being paralyzed is an unpleasant experience, to say the least. But think about this, dear man. Paralyzed 24-7. Every minute of his life, he was paralyzed. But there's something about this man that uh, just moves my spirit. He was a good man, and he had friends. I learned a long time ago, if you've got one friend you can really depend on and share with and share anything and walk away and you're still friends, you are one of the richest people in the world. Can we say amen to that? A friend and a friend in need is a friend indeed. Amen? And this guy, he had four friends. He was really in good shape. And so these four friends, in cooperation with one another, they decided we're going to take our friend to see Jesus. Now, one of the things that you and I as Christians want to do is to share Jesus with all of our friends, with all of our family, because, as the old hymn says, everybody needs the Lord. Um, we can't take it for granted that a certain person is saved because they are a good person or because they attend church. Billy Graham once said that at least 50% of church members are lost. They're unsaved. Now, I don't know how he came up with that 50%, but I think he was right. How about y'all? Did you hear me, Brother Phil? I know you heard me, and you looked at me like I just lost my mind. Well, think about that. Church members who aren't saved. I once had a man say to me, Paul, you're going to have to stop preaching so many evangelistic sermons. We're all saved. And I said, brother, I wish that were true. I wish that were true. And I just preached those happy, joyful sermons that would help all of us to say, oh my goodness, I have been touched and now that I feel so good because I went to worship this morning. Folks, the Bible tells us that we need to hear the old, old story again and again and again. This man paralyzed, his friends came and said, are you ready, Freddie? His name was Freddie. I'm kidding you on that. Don't know what his name was. But they came in and said, are you ready, Freddie? And he said, ready for what? You're going on a trip. And so guess what they did? He was asleep on his bed, which was a mat, more than likely. And each one of them grabbed the corner of that mat, and they took off to the house where Jesus was. And when they got there... There were so many people that they could not get into the room where Jesus was. Now, here is a wonderful lesson for us in the church. Sometimes the lives that we live stand in other people's way. I remember when I was uh, in the military, I served as a large wheeled vehicle mechanic 
None of you would ever know that I like working on vehicles, would you, Marcel? Not at all. I still do. Can't do much of it, but I still enjoy that. But I remember one time that we were pressed and the battalion commander and the brigade commander was coming in to inspect all of our equipment and I had this big prop shaft in my hand and I couldn't close the drawer where my tools were and I just took my foot and I slammed that drawer closed and lo and behold after the inspection was done this man came up to me and he said now you may be a preacher but I saw you when you were mad as a wet hen and you just kicked that drawer and I said I wasn't mad about anything and I'm not a wet hen uh, I just wanted to close that drawer now here he was thinking uh, that I wasn't a Christian because the way I closed that drawer now do you know what people watch what we do they watch and they listen to what we say and the way we say it. So what can we do about that? Be very, very careful how we live because we're going to influence other people's lives either in a positive way or a negative way. And I know that you are like I am. I want to influence people in a positive way. Now, Jesus is saying to the church, Church, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And remember that where there are two or three gathered together in my name, let's say it together, there I am in your midst. Think of it. Our Lord Jesus is here this morning. I see him. I look in your face and I see the face of Jesus. My brothers, my sisters, Jesus is here. Barry, you pick at me and tell me that I'm as old as dirt. And I see Jesus in your smile. He's here. He's always with us, isn't he? In one passage, Jesus asked a lady, what do you need? And if I should individually ask you this morning, what do you need from Jesus? We would all probably say different things. But I remember when Solomon was just entering into his ministry, replacing his father's ministry, God gave him a choice of what he wanted. What do you want? And Solomon prayed, oh, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. That's all he asked for. This morning... Whatever you need, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Whatever it is, ask and you shall receive. Now, I remember making this statement one Sunday morning and, and I realized that there was a lady sitting on the back pew and right beneath her seat, there was this huge German shepherd that brought her to church. Miss Alma von Cannon hadn't seen a thing in 30 years. And on the way out, she said to me, Pastor Paul, I know you're feeling bad because I'm blind and I can't see. But she patted her dog on his neck. He can see. I know every step of the way home, I see where I'm going. And she 
took my face in her hands and I see you and I see Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God gives us what we need. It took me a while as a young Christian to learn that lesson. He may not give us what we want all the time, but he gives us what we need. The psalmist David said in Psalm 23, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And if we have the Lord, indeed, we have all we need. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, unto the Lord God Almighty and to his blessed Son, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. What a statement. Glory in the church. And church, remember that when you assemble yourselves together, and you worship the Lord. Remember the day of the coming of the Lord is approaching. It is very near. He is at hand. Folks, I've even asked the Lord about this. I have a drippy nose and I'm sorry. Lord, uh, what can I do about this drippy nose? Carry an extra handkerchief. <laughs> Betty, I'll give you your $10 after church. Is up. <laughs> Betty, Betty knows exactly what to do with a drippy nose. Listen, little or small, Whatever our need is, God's going to supply that need. And I want you to notice that in this crowd, the hypocrites were there. How many people down through the years have said to me, Brother Paul, I'll come to church if you'll get rid of all of the hypocrites. And I always laugh out loud when they say that. I can't help it. I can't help it. Yes, there are hypocrites in the church. Everywhere you go, there are hypocrites. I had a young Marine say to me one time, we're the greatest fighting force in the world. He was just full of himself. He could jump out of a helicopter. He could jump out of a C-130. He could jump out of anything that they could get him in the air in. He could just do all sorts of things. And I said, well, son, you know there are hypocrites in the Marine Corps. What? There are no hypocrites in the Marine Corps. We're all loyal, faithful, and true. And about that time, a Marine had been charged with selling secrets to the Russians as he was serving there at the American embassy. And of all things, this particular Marine was a Native American. And I thought, good, gracious alive, he brought shame on Native Americans and on the Marine Corps. And this young Marine, he puffed himself up and said, well, there are a lot of you preachers that are hypocrites too. And I, I, I patted him on the shoulder and I said, son, you are absolutely right. But you know what? I am not about to let a hypocrite stand between me and Jesus. Now, you all hear that. You may not hear anything else I say, but remember that. Don't let a hypocrite, I don't care who it is, stand between you and Jesus. And here, these hypocrites... And Jesus called them out and he said, Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against people, for you neither go in yourselves 
and neither do you permit them that are entering to go in. And so they were still trying to find fault with Jesus. And so Paul would later on in his life and ministry say to young Timothy, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And so Jesus just continued to preach the word even though the hypocrites were there. And that's what we have to do is to live good lives and share the word as we go along. Then I want us to focus our attention on this paralyzed sinner. Sin is the dreaded disease that paralyzes the soul of every man, woman, and child. This sad figure is an accurate picture of every unsaved person. This man could not help himself. He was completely helpless in that particular area. So no human virtue or strength is strong enough to save. And there was this wonderful, wonderful thing going on. There was cooperation in soul winning, bringing this man to Jesus. From time to time, Brother Joe Boone will send us a message. And primarily it says this, pray for revival. Joe, we do. Thank you for those messages. Thank you for those scriptural reminders that revival comes only from the Lord. And revival begins where? Begins with moi. I think that's French for me. And it begins with you. We want revival. Let's be serious about it. And God will give us revival. These four men plan to bring their friend to Jesus. One hears that Jesus is in the house. He tells another friend. And another friend says, buddy, you and I are old and decrepit. Let's get these two young guys. We'll get David and Jonathan. By George, they're young and strong. They're like two little black Angus bulls. I mean, they can carry a load. So here's two old guys and two young guys, and they're carrying this paralyzed guy to see Jesus. That's almost comical if you'll, if you'll just visualize that in your mind. It really is. And then, lo and behold, one of them must have been a uh, uh, a mason or a carpenter or something, when they couldn't get in the door, he said, I know what we're going to do. We'll go up the outside stairs and we'll let him down through the roof. Now, this is a time when literally some friends raised the roof in order to get their friend to Jesus. Can you imagine seeing it in the Daily News? that the roof was raised at Lillington Baptist Church Sunday morning, the 11th of July. God sent revival to the people there and it's spreading everywhere. It's worse than COVID-19. God is bringing revival. They have raised the roof. Well, the roof was flat. It was made of mud and it was made of branches. So they tore it up. They let their friend down into the presence of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to the man. He said that I forgive you of your sin. Some time ago, Donna and I were in Jacksonville. We had a dear friend who was deathly sick. And the folks there at Onslow Memorial just simply were not helping him. Now, I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you the way it is. And his wife and nephew came to see us about three weeks ago. Haven't seen them in years. 
But his name was Alton Kennedy, and he had he retired as one of the outstanding bankers there in Jacksonville. But he's in the hospital, and we know he's dying. So a friend came while Don and I were there visiting, and he said, step into my office. And what he meant was, follow me out into the hallway. And I did. And he said, Paul, Alton is dying. We have to do something. And I said, okay, what? He said, let's get him out of here and carry him to Newburgh. How are we going to do that? He said, do you know how to make a pack saddle? Y'all know what that is? Now you know, don't you? We got our friend. We said, Alton, you're leaving. He said, thank God. We got him. We're holding him. We carry him to the elevator. We go down to the level where, and we've already sent Betty, his wife, to get the car. And there we are. And she is so close to the curb that the door can't be opened. It's a brand new car, a two-door hardtop. And I said, Betty, let all the windows down. She let them down, and we laid him out just like this. Put him in the front seat, and we got him to Newburn. After an hour and a half of surgery, the doctor came out, and he said to all of us, he said, you guys just saved Mr. Kennedy's life. You got him here just in time for the emergency surgery we have performed. He's in recovery. He's doing fine, and he'll wake up in about an hour or an hour and a half. He did. And after several days in the hospital, uh, he was carried home. Now, J.C. and I, we were no longer the friends of the folks at the hospital in Jacksonville. I thought they were going to bar us from ever going into the hospital again because we stole a patient. Can you imagine the lawsuit? Pastor Fowler and the chairman of deacons, chairman of deacons over there, we just stole one of their patients. You know what? We didn't care. We didn't care if they sued us. We didn't care if they put us in jail. What we cared about was Alton. We got him to a doctor who could help him. Now then, folks, when we bring people to Jesus, we're bringing them to the great physician. We're bringing them to the Savior. We're bringing them to the one and the only one who can save them from their sin, can save them from their self who can save them from the satanic forces of evil that's loose in this world. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen? So I'm asking you this morning to be as bold as a lion when it comes to bringing people to Jesus. If you have to bring them to Jesus, bed and all, bring them. I remember this young Marine that used to come to church every Sunday morning while he was in the training area there at New River. And he wore a big old Stetson hat, gray, like the Texas Rangers wear. He wore blue jeans that were honestly worn out. He wore them out back on the ranch in Texas, really. And he rode his steed to church every Sunday morning. Guess what it was? It was a skateboard about this long. He could move on that thing. He's coming up the sidewalk. 
And here a bunch of us are standing on the sidewalk. And I said, guys, move. Make a hole as the Marines would say, make a hole, I'm coming through. Here he comes. And he turns, he jumps the curb, and he's in the sanctuary. Got his big old skateboard under his arm. He goes to the back pew, puts his skateboard under the, the, the pew, and there he is to worship. Holding his Stetson hat in his, in his lap, and he's praising the Lord. Some of the finest Christians I've ever met were Marines. Believe it or not, Marines and sailors. Well, I'm thankful that when a man comes to Jesus, Jesus changes them. Amen. I saw a sign at a church just recently. It said, come on in. You can change inside. Amen. Come on in, you can change inside. Well, that's what Jesus does for us. He helps us to change inside. We can get people to Jesus in spite of the crowd. These men were, they had perseverance par excellence. They were faithful, they were hopeful, they were determined, they were innovative and they were resourceful. Isn't that a mouthful? I hear words like that all the time coming from uh, the Baptist State Convention telling us that that's what we need to do in the church. That's what we need to be in the church. Do you know what? Every one of those words come right out of the Bible. Faithful, hopeful, determined, innovative, and resourceful. And if we're bringing people to Jesus, that's what we need to be. All of these things. And then when Jesus saw the man, he forgave his sins, and then he healed his body. And he said to these four men, when he saw their faith, I will heal him. I will heal him. And if you were lost this morning, this paralyzed man is a perfect picture of you. And if you will come to Jesus in faith, Jesus said, come. Come and I will give you life, eternal life, and I will do it now. Do it now. Again, Jesus said, just ask me and you shall receive. And if you are saved, God wants you to be a soul winner. Do you know that God calls every Christian to be a soul winner? Joe, I like those messages you send reminding us we're to be soul winners. Soul winners. And Daniel said, and this is the prophet Daniel, he said that uh, soul winners are wise. He that wins souls are wise in the eyes of God. And whatever God has promised, he will fulfill. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerned in his righteousness, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. If you need to come to Jesus for salvation, the invitation is for you. If you need to come and dedicate your life to the Lord and ask him to help you to be a soul winner, the invitation is for you. But don't just sit there. Make a decision. Make a decision to follow Jesus. Kathy, God bless you.